I thought we were just going to keep on singing, so I was going to stay right over there and enjoy it. <laughs> I don't get the whole day off? Okay. <laughs> now, please open your Bible to the book of Revelation chapter 8. I hope none of you are going to the table of contents to find out where this book is at. <laughs> so as we've been going through this study, um, we've really seen a lot of very, very cool things and awesome things. And I suppose on which side of the aisle, so to speak, you're on, maybe some pretty scary things, too. Um, aren't you glad this morning that there's nothing here that we need to be scared of? Nothing here that we need to fear. And, and to me, that's the thing that I want you to know as we're going through this together. I'm not doing this to scare you. I'm just doing this so that we'll understand part of what God's plan is as much as we can understand it in our natural minds, of course, with the Holy Spirit helping us to understand. And we want to keep in mind as we go through here that, you know, some of these things are being seen from different perspectives. Sometimes it's a perspective from earth looking up to heaven, and sometimes it's the perspective of being in heaven and looking down on earth, as is the case that we're going into here. Um, and John, you know, you really got to give it to him. Trying to describe events um, in his own experience, in his own knowledge, with, with the things that he's able to comprehend, think about these events are being shown to him, and these are things that are going to happen 2,000 years in the future. Now, if someone were to come to you and show you a picture of what was going to happen 2,000 years from now, you know, you might have a hard time putting it into words, trying to describe what you're seeing. Of course, I believe 2,000 years from now, we're going to be in the presence of the Lord, of course, forever and ever and ever. And how do you, how do you describe that, right? Um, but, you know, you might be able to kind of sympathize with John in a way here as he uh, goes through this, this uh, revelation with us and uh, the things that he's viewing, the uh, effort that he's making to uh, go above and beyond the norm, I would say, of his imagination and his own vocabulary. Um, it seems to me that these catastrophes, if you will, that we've been looking at. You know, God, basically we know that God could accomplish every one of the acts in Revelation uh, just from his supernatural power. He could just will it and it would take place. Um, but it seems to me that a lot of the things that we're looking at um, are actually a result, uh, these catastrophes of uh, man's Neglect of God, of our society deteriorating, um, committing suicide, if you will, you know, and uh, the things that are being done to the earth. Uh, a lot of these things are very, they're, they're consequences. I guess that's what I'm trying to get out here. They're consequences of man turning away from God. And how many of you know that every time you do that, when you turn away from God, there's going to be consequences in your life, and they're not going to be good. Now, sometimes we need a spanking, don't we? Sometimes we need a little bit of time out, and God will do that because he loves us. But who likes to get spankings, you know? I'm not real crazy about it, but, you know, I get them, uh, and it stings. But I'm always reminded through that that, you know, God is still my father, and I'm his son, and that's why he's disciplining me, because he loves me. And, uh, of course, the Bible tells us that that shows that we're his children when he disciplines us. Because that's what a good father does. Um, discipline on a global scale is what we're looking at here. Uh, 
We're looking at reaping what they've sown for so many, many years. The effort to block God out of every area of life, to try to put those of us who hold to these truths to kind of push us to the side a little bit, maybe more than a little bit, maybe even to the point of silencing your voice, because the world wants to go another way. The world wants to go another direction, and you know, they're going that direction at full speed. They're going that direction blind. They don't see what lies ahead. Paul tells us in the word that we should be watchmen. And I believe that is so important for us in, on many levels. The first of which you should be, we should be watchmen over our own lives, over our own personal relationship with the Lord. And I've always had this picture of the old cavalry, you know, the cowboys, uh, the Indian kind of a thing. And you got a fort out in the middle of the desert somewhere, you know. And the fort has these big walls made out of logs. And, and there's the lookout tower and there's a guard up there. And he's looking way out there with his little, you know, he's looking for the enemy. He's a watchman. He's on guard. And I think that the word teaches us that we need to be that way too. In our own lives and in the things that are going on around us, we also need to be aware. Jesus talked about the thief. And, and he said how, you know, if he would have known that he was coming, you might have done something to stop it from happening. But the blindness of the world, they're just continually running headlong in that direction. And if you are the watchman on the wall and you do have your little telescope and you're looking out there and far off in the distance, you see a cloud of maybe dust coming up and you, and you notice it and you're looking at it and you're going, oh boy, it draws your attention and now you want to start focusing on it. And as it draws closer and closer, you realize it's the enemy. It's the enemy. It's not reinforcements. It's the enemy coming. But because there's a watchman on the wall, he's able to, to alert the people to the danger. And they're able to prepare for what's coming. That's what we're called to do, you guys. Be a watchman on the wall. Not only in my own life and in your own life, but, but the lives around us too. And I'm not really talking here about being pushy or shoving things down people's throat that, you know, maybe, uh, maybe even in your own family, people that don't know the Lord. And you know, every time you try to have that discussion with them, it never really comes out the way you would want it to come out. So a lot of times we just come to the point where we say, you know what, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut from now on. Well, you know, that's one way to solve the problem. But another way, you know, is to live our lives in a way as uh, everyone's going through difficult circumstances, to live our lives in a way that demonstrates to them that our hope is on a much higher level than theirs, that our hope is actually a living hope, that our faith is alive, that we're not just putting our hope in man to try to fix things because he won't be able to fix things. That's the downfall. That's part of the lie to think that, you know, we can fix this, you guys. And it's been going on for so many years that we've been attempting to fix it. But it would appear to me the harder we try to fix it, the deeper we sink into the quicksand. And that's what they say about when you get in that kind of quicksand. The harder you struggle, the faster you go down. And it almost seems like that's where the world's at these days. But not you. Not the church. We're called to be a light in the world. We're called to be a light to the people around us who are struggling. We're called to be different. And that means that we need to really be spiritually aware of how easy it is for the adversary to use little tidbit things and blow them way out of proportion in our relationships, with our families, in our marriages, in our friendships. 
the day that we're living in today, there's so many issues that want to creep in there and divide. There's issues in there that they're ungodly. And people are taking sides. And, you know, it's so important for us to remember what side we're on. We're on Jesus' side. We're on each other's side. We have one another, and that's so important to remember. That's why the Bible tells us, don't forsake the fellowship of the brothers and sisters. It's so important for us to be together, to have not just a Sunday morning thing, but it's important for us to have communications with each other and develop relationships. Because we're preparing for something that's coming. We're preparing to be transported, if you will. We're going to get beamed up, if you will. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. That's what we should be preparing for today. That's what we should be looking for. And I don't want you to be distracted by the things that are going on around you in the world. Because God's plan supersedes all that stuff. God's plan is far superior to all of that stuff. And his plan for you and me this morning is blessed. It's awesome. It's beyond your comprehension of what God has in store. As a matter of fact, the scripture tells us it hasn't even entered into our minds the things that God have prepared for those that love him. So with that being said, this idea that the world is, in this study that we're doing, the world is winding down in a sense. There's been a lot of, uh, the phrase is thrown around a lot, the end of the world. Well, the book of Revelation really is not about the end of the world. Really, I think the book of Revelation is about the creator of the world, the creator of the universe, telling the human race in which he entrusted this beautiful creation to, he's taking it back. I trusted it to you guys. You've destroyed it. You can't get along. I'm going to repo it from you. And really, truly, we know from Scripture who really is running the earth today. The Bible tells us it's the prince of the power of the air. You see, he took that title deed to the earth when Adam and Eve fell in the garden. It was given to Lucifer, and ever since then, he's had it. He's a usurper. He really doesn't belong on that seat. It's really not his world. He has taken it even Without God's blessing, if you will. And there's going to come a time, very, very soon, when foreclosure is going to happen, if you will. And the Lord is going to take back what is His. That includes His people. That includes us. That includes the earth. Because, you know... The human race just cannot be trusted with these things. In and of ourselves, we are so self-absorbed, so into temporal satisfaction, things that don't last, that we miss the whole idea about what we're here for. 50 years ago, 75 years ago, whatever, these things that we're reading about, They were totally spiritualized. They were totally made to look like allegories. They were never thought of as literal events. Because like John, even 75 years ago, people had no idea what kind of technology we would have today. People had no idea that there is technology today that could destroy the earth many times over. And for them, you know, say in the late 1800s, to see a nuclear explosion, to see something like that happen, how would they be able to put that into words? 
they would have a really, really hard time. Today, we know exactly what it is. Today, we have the technology to destroy ourselves. Isn't that a wonderful thing to know? Huh? Jesus said, except these days be shortened, there will be no flesh that will survive. That's how serious this is. And thank God that he's going to come and he's going to intervene at the right time and prevent that from actually becoming the end of the human race. When we were in the sixth chapter, we were introduced um, to these horsemen, the, uh, the white one, uh, the red one, the black one, and the gray one. And each one of them spoke specifically of their mission, so to speak. And we began to see things unfurling on the earth and also in heaven. And I had mentioned to you last week as we went into chapter 7 um, that this is kind of a parenthesis, if you will. It's kind of an intermission to the timeline that we're studying. It's stuck in there to let us know that God does never leave himself without a witness, no matter what the situation is. And so when we were going through chapter 6, I found it very interesting because... We got down through the uh, sixth seal, and then all of a sudden chapter 7 pops up, and there's no seventh seal being opened. It's not opened until the beginning of chapter 8. And if you are, actually, if you were to look at the last verse of chapter 6, in verse 17, it says, The great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? This is speaking of the result of opening up the sixth seal. And in our text this morning, when you pick it up in verse 1 of chapter 8, he says, he opened up the seventh seal. So chapter 7 is really kind of a, a break in the timeline of the revelation, if you will. It's giving us some inside information in chapter 7. But as we move into chapter 8, we see the process continuing on. Remember in the fifth seal that John saw um, many souls underneath the altar. And all of those souls had been slain because of the word of God. And they were crying out to God, when are you going to avenge us? Will you avenge us? And, you know, he will avenge them. It's going to happen. All of those who have died in the faith, been martyred for their faith, have shed their blood because of their belief in Jesus Christ, they'll be under this altar. And yes, as we see this morning, as we go through this chapter... That vengeance is going to be unleashed upon those who harmed them. For me and you this morning, it's really good to know that the Bible teaches us that we are not destined for his wrath. Very important for you to realize that, especially in the times that we're in right now. We are not destined for his wrath. We are destined for heaven. We are destined to obtain salvation through Jesus. We are destined to escape all of these things. That's what the Bible says. And I like that. It brings comfort to me. I hope it brings comfort to you too. 1 Thessalonians 5.9 says, God has not appointed us to suffer wrath. Hmm. Now, notice the word difficulty. Sickness, tribulation, persecution, none of those words are in that passage. And we know for sure that we do go through that, people do go through those things. 
We go through difficult times and sicknesses and, and, and persecutions and tribulations and trials. It's part of life. But the one thing the word wants you to know for sure, he has not appointed you to suffer his wrath. That should bring great comfort to you this morning. No matter how close you find yourself or how maybe a little bit distant you find yourself from the Lord today. You can look at that and you can say, you know what, I can draw close to him. I want to hold on to him tight. Because he's going to rescue me from his wrath. He has always done that all through history. And he'll continue to do that until he establishes his kingdom on the earth. So in the eighth chapter, I want to pick it up in verse one. It's a short chapter. It's going to go ahead and read down through it. Verse one says, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God and to them were given seven trumpets. And then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar, and he was given much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. And then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it to the earth. And there were noises and thundering and lightning and an earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood. And they were thrown to the earth. And a third of the trees were burned up. And all the green grass was burned up. And then the second angel sounded. And something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood. And a third of the living creatures in the sea died. And a third of the ships were destroyed. And then the third angel sounded. And a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch. And it fell on the third of all the rivers and the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. And a third of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died from the water because it was made bitter. And then the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened. A third of the day did not shine, likewise the night. And I looked, and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Whoa, whoa, whoa to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. We're going to stop right there. So you'll notice we didn't reach all seven of those trumpets. The other three, they're saved, is being saved for chapter nine, and there's a reason for that. These first four trumpets... These seven angels, if you will. Who are these seven angels? Well, we read about them in the beginning of the book of Revelation. We read about the seven angels, how they're standing around in the throne of God. The seven spirits of the seven churches standing in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, which is the church in heaven. And these seven angels are doing God's bidding. They're the seven spirits who are before his throne, and that's what they exist for, is to do his bidding. And during the church age, 
These seven angels doing their bidding was focused on the bride, focused on the church, focused on the time of the Gentiles, which we are now living. But when the time of the Gentiles draws to a close, the mission of these seven angels begins to change now. Rather than being in care of the church, it's not necessary. The church is in the throne room of God. God is taking care of us now. But the seven angels or the seven spirits, they're not done. They still have work to do. And the scripture tells us that they're standing ready. And that these trumpets were given to them by God. This is why I said earlier when we first started that God has the ability in and of himself without angels, without humans, without any intervention to accomplish all of these things on his own. But we see that there are many, many things incorporated in his plan as this book continues to progress. So these seven trumpets were given to them and they were entrusted with them. They had a responsibility to blow these trumpets or instruments, if you will, at the right time. And each one of them would announce judgment of Almighty God upon the whole planet. So the seventh seal, actually, when it's opened, it introduces the seven trumpets. That's what the seventh seal is. Remember, I tried to show you a picture of the almost telescopic form of this book, the way it's laid out. That the seventh seal opens up and out of it come the seven trumpets. In verse 3 is interesting. It said, I saw another angel having a golden censer. And he came and he stood at the altar and he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayer of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. So what is this incense all about? What is this angel all about? Well, some think this angel is Jesus. People argue about the identity of this angel with the golden censer. And in the Old Testament, there are phrases that say the angel of the Lord, and it's actually referring to Jesus, but you don't find that anywhere in the New Testament. That, that, that word, that phrase is gone in the New Testament. He's the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament. So it would not really fit in with the flow of scripture uh, to try to assume that this angel is Jesus. Jesus is the one who opened the scroll. He's never described as an angel. And John, in uh, Revelation chapter 2, when we get there, we're going to see that uh, John actually fell down before an angel to try and worship the angel. And, And, of course, the angel stopped him right away and said, don't worship me. Worship God only. This must be a mighty angel. This must be an awesome sight. This angel that carries the censer. You know, there's a lot of um, words that give us clues and things as we go through the Bible. And one of those phrases is um, like unto. I saw a man. I saw a person like unto the son of man. Does that mean that he saw the Son of Man? No. It means that he saw an angel that looked like he was like unto the Son of Man. We have that same thing going on here. And this awesome angel who is holding this censer in his hands... um, has a very specific role. In his censer are all the prayers of all the people who were martyred during the tribulation period. 
all the people who were martyred from the beginning of Christianity until the moment that this is happening in heaven, all of their souls are under the altar and they're crying out, when will you avenge us, Lord? Here it comes. This angel's bringing it. But he starts off with incense, and it's a lot of incense. Incense represents prayer. When they would burn incense in the temple, it was representative of the people's prayers going up into heaven. And it had a nice odor to it. It was a sweet smell as they went and rose up into heaven. It was a picture of how our prayers ascend into the presence of God. And this is a, a, the same exact thing, but on a larger scale, a huge scale. This is showing us that God hears their prayers. Much incense. That he would offer it with the prayers of all the saints. Now, you might remember when we began the study as we moved into chapter 4 and 5. I told you that there's a couple of words that are going to disappear out of the text. One of the words is bride. The other one is church. Church. But one of the words that will continue on through the book is the word saints. These are separate and, di and distinctly different groups of people. The bride is no longer on the earth. But there are people coming to know the Lord. There are people surrendering to him. They're referred to as saints. And this is what the prayers of these incense, these saints who gave their lives... And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. The seven angels. Well, the speaking of the seven angels, I just want to make one little addition to what I was saying about this particular angel. I said that it's not Jesus. When it speaks of the angel, it said another angel. Well, in the Greek, if you look at that, it means the phrase that I used earlier, another of the same kind. He wasn't one of the seven, but he was another of the same kind. He was an angel, powerful, mighty angel. And the Bible tells us in Hebrews that these angels are ministering spirits, that they serve the Lord and they do his pleasure day and night. One of the tasks of the priests in the Old Testament was to offer incense in the tabernacle. From the altar, it would, it would be placed in a big golden censer that was filled with incense. And the smoke of it would be offered in the altar right in front of the mercy seat. That's a beautiful picture. When you look at the temple and the things that went on in the Old Testament and the temple, it's a perfect picture of heaven. We see it happening in the book of Revelation, and it's the same type of thing that was happening in the Old Testament. The high priest, who is Jesus, our high priest, but the high priest would offer this incense... Before the mercy seat. And it was positioned right next to the veil in which no one was allowed to penetrate except the high priest. Now we know the Bible tells us now in the New Testament that veil has been torn from the top to the bottom. And I'm not talking about a little curtain. I'm talking about a very, very thick piece of material here. Something was layered upon layer upon layer, and it was very heavy. There was no way any human being could tear it, especially from the top to the bottom. You know who tore it? The father tore it. He ripped it right down the middle and got away from it. Why did he do that? Because that veil was keeping you and me from being in his presence. That veil was keeping us because of our sin. From going into the very holy of holies where God dwells. And the Bible is very clear that that veil is no longer there. It was removed 
when Jesus was crucified for our sin. It was removed when he rose from the dead. And now you and I, we had the exact same access to God's throne room as the high priest did in the Old Testament. Because that veil has been torn. But this picture of the incense and the mercy seat and the veil, it's just all there and it's so beautiful. It's such a perfect typology, if you will. And I believe that these prayers that we're reading about in chapter 8 are the same prayers from those people who were crying for justice in the previous two chapters. And it's reasonable since the next, this angel comes along and, and it fills the censer with coals of fire from the altar, it's almost as like, it's almost as though he's gone with the incense in the censer and he's, he's, he's done that and now he's going to fill it up with coals of fire and guess what? Vengeance is coming for these people whose souls are underneath this altar and he hurls it into the earth. And when he does hurl it into the earth, it tells us that there was peals of thunder. Man, you know what that's like, right? I mean, thunder that's so close to you that it shakes your gizzard when it goes, you know? Thunder that's so close to you, you can't really separate the, the lightning from the thunder itself because it happens all so quickly. Imagine that on a humongous scale. And he describes it. There were noises. Now, this is interesting because at the very beginning, in verse 1, it says there was silence for about 30 minutes in heaven. And up to this point, all we've seen is praise and song and celebration and sounds and rejoicing of multitudes. And now suddenly, before this seal is opened, there's silence. What do you suppose is going on there? There's silence for, the Bible said, 30 minutes. It's almost as though there's a pause here. Have you ever been in really, really, really silent silence? <laughs> Where you can hear your blood flowing through your blood vessels and stuff? I mean, it's just really silent. It's almost as though there's a pause before the storm. And that's what I think we're seeing here. There's that last 30 moments in heaven. Maybe all the angels are praying and saying, come on, everybody, repent right now before I have to thrust this thing down into the earth. But men don't repent, do they? Their hearts have been hardened. You know, I think as time goes by, the division that we have, the ones on this side and the ones on this side, the believers, the non-believers, the friction in between. I think it's going to get worse and worse. It's going to become more and more obvious that we are adversary, that we aren't the good guys, that we're a hindrance to the plan of man, and that we are. I can guarantee you as time goes by, as far as the world's concerned, you will never win a popularity contest because you're a Christian. As a matter of fact, we're going to find it more and more difficult. We're going to find more and more prejudice against us because of our faith. Well, what about those who are against us? What about those who are continually turning away? Their hearts are becoming harder and harder and harder. Just like Pharaoh's heart did. Their hearts are becoming so hard that there's going to come a time when they, they just don't have it in them to repent. All they have left is to shake their fist at God and curse Him. All they have left is to try to hide from Him. And you know you can't hide from God. But perhaps this is the moment when that last martyr has lost his life. And now this Censor is thrown into the earth, and the hearts of men have become so hardened that they can't repent. Each one of these 
trumpets that we look at, they get more and more intense when it comes to God's judgment upon the world. And the first angel, of course, sounds his trumpet in verse 7. And it says, well, after he sounded his trumpet, that there was hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth. And a third part of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. That's the first one. Note, a third part. Now, as we go down through here, we're gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm going to throw out a, a thought to you that perhaps would be um, accurate. Um, I hope it is, but when we get down through here a little bit, I'll share that with you. But this does not look very encouraging for those who are left on this earth. You know, the Bible tells us that every single person during this time that's still on this planet is going to suffer the wrath of God. Every one of them. Now, in the last chapter 6, we saw that God had set apart 144,000. Those 144,000 were sealed. And I believe they do survive the tribulation. But everyone else is going to suffer all of these things that are coming upon the world. And here's this hail that comes out of the sky. Does it remind you of any other story in the Bible? Of hail and fire mixed with blood? Well, maybe not with the blood, but how about the hail and the fire? Exodus 9, 23 said, When Moses stretched out his staff towards the sky, the Lord sent thunder and hail, and lightning flashed down to the ground. And so the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt, and hail fell, and lightning flashed back and forth. It was the worst storm in all the land of Egypt since it had become a nation. And throughout Egypt, hail struck everything in the fields, both men and animals. And it beat down everything growing in the fields, and it stripped every tree. How many of you believe that really happened? Huh? I better see some hands going up here. You think this is a fairy tale? You think Moses was bored one day and just kind of came up with the idea? This is a fact. And can you see the similarities between this and this first trumpet being blown? There's one thing missing in this one, and that's the blood part. I saw a, oh, I guess it was like a, I don't know, Na National Geographic thing. or Oh, it was the Weather Channel. And they had this thing about this, uh, these tornadoes that are out in the ocean. Water spouts, I guess they call them. And they were talking about this water spout that was in the ocean, and it came ashore. And as it came ashore, 30 miles inland, there were thousands of fish on the ground, flopping around. And they died. And the stench and the smell of it just was horrible. And so they're doing this story. And I was reading this, and I was thinking about that, and I was thinking, wow, could you imagine that much power in that little in that twister to suck those fish up out of the ocean, carry them 30 miles inland, and deposit them on dry ground? Seems pretty incredible. But when we think about all the death, when we think about the turmoil, when we think about the severity of this storm in this chapter that we're in right now, is it possible that some of those animals who died, some of those people who died, perhaps were sucked up into the sky and they came back down with the hail and the fire and blood? Possible. I can't explain it all to you because I don't know. But it would appear to me that maybe this is the, the outcome of a natural disaster. Maybe it's the outcome of a nuclear holocaust. Or maybe something specifically designed by the Lord. And of course, yes, these events are tragic. Notice, a third of the vegetation on the earth is burned up. And all the grass is scorched. 
Imagine the effect that that would have on food production. How famine would come so quickly. We know very well about huge forest fires. We know very well how destructive and quickly they can move. And how they can just scorch the land. Imagine it on a scale this size. Then the second angel. The second angel sounded and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood. And again we have that phrase that I want to point out to you. John said it was something like a mountain. That doesn't mean it was a mountain falling out of the sky. As he saw it coming, it looked like a mountain on fire. What do you think that was? I don't know. Meteor? Could it be a meteor? Possibly. Could it be a plume of a nuclear bomb? Possibly. But again, we see the destruction that takes place as a result of it. And this time it's in the ocean. It's in the sea. And interestingly enough, this particular second uh, uh, trumpet that is sounded, it says that it takes out not just the, 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 the sea, but it also takes out um, the creatures in the sea and, interesting, a third of the ships that were in the sea. Now, a lot of commentators look at the word sea in a singular uh, way. And the sea is what we have here in our, in our wording. And it would seem to indicate to a lot of commentators, this is the Mediterranean Sea. Not all the seas on the earth. And this, this disaster is described in very symbolic language. Not that it was a literal mountain. But John looked at it and thought, wow, that does look like a giant mountain. And we don't know what it is. Could it have been a nuclear explosion? Yeah. You know, when we see those films of those bombs exploding, most of the time we see them exploding at ground level or just above ground level. But the most effective nuclear explosion is up in the air. It's up in the sky, high up. And, and you would look up and just see a flash of light, and then you'd be gone. Because the explosion is able to have its fullest impact as it comes down from the sky. It could have looked like a mountain on fire in the sky. Don't really know. But, you know, it seems that the sea um, that's being talked about here could possibly, likely be the Mediterranean Sea. It suggests that no animals or human life has survived this catastrophe. And the Mediterranean Sea, by the way, is really filled with fish, a lot of fish. As a matter of fact, fishing is one of the major ways that many countries that live around that sea survive. And so this disaster would have a terrible effect on everyone in the world, especially those who live around the Mediterranean area. One third of the ships are destroyed. Interesting. This is uh, significant because when you look over at the Mediterranean Sea today, you'll find that it's the permanent location of the United States Sixth Fleet. A lot of ships. Also, there are Soviet vessels there. And there are ships from many other countries of the world. Sometimes the Mediterranean Sea is the place where most of the ships in the whole world have decided to be. So you have this great congregation of ships in that specific area right there. And we're talking cruise ships, naval ships, fishing boats, boats and ships of all sizes. And a third of them will be destroyed. And then we have the third angel, and I better hurry up. The third angel um, 
sounded and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on the third of the rivers and the springs. Now we're being attacked in the fresh water. All the fresh water is becoming undrinkable. The name of the star is Wormwood. Now, very, very possible something's coming out of the heavens. It lands onto the fresh water, and it's, it's toxic. Perhaps it's nuclear. Whatever it is, it pollutes all the fresh water. And there's nothing to drink. And many men die because of the water. And again, a lot of commentators look at this and say, this is generalized in the Mediterranean area where all of the activity of Armageddon and all the stress and all that stuff is happening today. A great star. Wormwood. Here's something that might uh, uh, interest you a little bit. The word wormwood, translated in Russian, is Chernobyl. Ah, how about that? So we could walk away from that and say, well, what happened in Chernobyl? Well, it was a nuclear problem, and it wasted all the water. So could this wormwood also be another nuclear thing that takes place and, and takes out all the water? Possibly. I'm not saying for sure. I don't know. But, you know, you find the word wormwood in many, many different uh, scriptures in the Old Testament, and Lamentations, and Amos, and Jeremiah. They all talk about wormwood, water that's undrinkable. And then the fourth angel sounds his trumpet. And a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of the heavens were darkened, and a third of the day did not shine, likewise the night. So here's another one. I don't know if this means that daytime was reduced by a third, or if the lights of the heavenly bodies are obscured, by fallout, smoke, debris, don't really know. Um, but what I do know, and you guys remember probably, a lot of you, I wasn't here then, but I remember when Mount St. Helens erupted. You remember the impact that that had around here and all over the, all over the area right here? Many places where daylight turned to night, dusk, if you will. Could you imagine that on a humongous scale? A couple, uh, was it last year, my wife and I went to Montana. I'd never been to Yellowstone before, so we went there, and we were hanging out there and checking it all out, and I was looking at a map. You know that whole park is a caldera? It encompasses like three states. It's one volcano, guys. It's the caldera of one volcano. Could you imagine if that thing blew its top? We think Mount St. Helens was something? That would be a sparkler compared to. So for us to envision in our mind these things happening, these catastrophes, you might say, how in the world could that ever happen? Oh, it can happen. Very, very quickly. So this angel, there's another angel here. After this, uh, the day and the night was no longer... Uh, there And he says, I looked, I heard another angel flying through the midst of heaven saying in verse 13, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blast of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. These are the three woes. These last three trumpets. We're going to look at them next Sunday. But the angel is announcing it before it happens. Very, very, very rare in the Bible do you find a word repeated three times. Very rare. Jesus said many times, verily, verily, I say unto you. Sometimes he said, verily, I say unto you. Verily means truly. Truly, I say to you. I'm not kidding around here. Or verily, verily, pay attention. I'm really, really serious here. But you didn't hear him say, verily, 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 I say unto you. But we do hear the word of God talking about God's holiness. What does it say? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Above and beyond all things. Here we have the only example of this being a word being repeated three times like this. The three woes. The next three trumpets that are going to blow. 
And in the next chapter, a star falls from heaven. And a shaft opens up in the earth. And there's some really bizarre things that come up out of the shaft. So, let me ask you something this morning before we go home. Come on up, worship team. Are you hoping this morning for the goodwill of men to see us through? Are you hoping because you live in the wonderful country of the United States of America that it's all going to be okay? You know, many, many years ago, I remember a day when hands across the world happened. I don't know if it was... And one individual that got it started, I think. But the whole idea was, we're all going to hold hands clear across America and around the world. And we're going to fix it. We can do this together. That was probably 30 years ago. Boy, haven't we come a long way. We're so much better off, aren't we? You know, it seems to me the easier that life gets, the more technology that comes on the scene, the more dangerous the other side of all that is. There's a price to be paid for all of that stuff. And we're seeing it just explode in our very midst these days. Maybe you're here this morning and you're thinking, wow, pastor, you're out of your mind. To even talk about this stuff as though it's real. There's a watchman on the wall and he's trying to tell you, I see dust in the distance. Prepare yourselves. And then the question has to be asked, are you prepared? Are you ready? Are you going to be able to stand in that day? Or are you going to crumble under pressure? If you think you're a crumbler, you don't have to be. Maybe you feel like you're just a little bit away from the Lord this morning. And you really should get your compass adjusted. And you have that opportunity to do that today. Maybe you have a prayer need for a family member. Maybe you're just struggling and you would like some prayer. We have a couple right over there. Lovely couple, aren't they? They would love to pray with you. And I want to encourage you. Take five minutes. If you need prayer, there's a nice little prayer room there. It's private. We're not going to put it in the bulletin next week. But we would encourage you. Get prayer if you need it this morning, okay? Now more than ever, now more than ever, you guys, we need to be aware of what's going on. Yeah, it's my job to be a watchman on the wall, but it's your job too, for you and yours. And so that's my prayer for us this morning that we would do that, that we would not allow these crazy things that we're reading about to disappoint us, to scare us, to cause us to be disciplined. Romans 5, 1, 2, I'll close with this. Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Father, thank you so much this morning, Lord. Thank you for this great group of people, this great church, the great things that you're doing here during these times that we're living in. And Lord, we want to be available even as those seven angels stand by waiting to do your bidding, Lord. We want to be like that too. We want to be on call whenever you want, Lord, to call us to do your bidding, to serve you with all of our heart. To not allow any of these things that are happening around us to creep in and pollute us and snuff out that flame that we have inside of us. I pray this morning, God, that your living water would just flow upon all of us. That your love would fill our hearts and our minds. And Lord, come quickly. We long for you, Lord. We trust you with everything that we have, including our eternal life. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen.